Shout with joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Would you stand with us this morning and let's make his praise glorious. Praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to you. Please. 
rejoice in the Lord always. You may be seated. We're certainly glad that you ventured out on this uh, cold, blustery day in Iowa. Yesterday was just nice, and I went for a walk outside, and uh, it was lovely, but I'm not doing that today. So we're grateful that you came. No, there's been a lot that's battled sickness and lots going on that way, but uh, we're glad that you're healthy in here, and I uh, hope that you enjoy your start to the 2015 by worshiping with us. Just a couple announcements. Um, was handed this note. Next week, Sunday after church, the Concerned Christian Women will meet. All women are welcome to attend. If you can't attend, please give your offering to Dottie or mission offering to Jeannie. And so the CCW will meet next Sunday after church. Also today, we do have our booklets, annual books, and uh, some of you look forward to having those, and it tells you when you serve, and, and it becomes your brains, and what your responsibilities are new to this. New this year to, in your books are as a directory of familiar faces. So if you want to have a phone number, cell phone number, address of those that you see here at church, that comes in handy as well. Make sure you pick one of those up on the way out. We appreciate the ladies that put those together for us and, and hope that you find those helpful as, as together as a church we meet needs and, and try to take care of those things. That booklet's really helpful for us. Oh, let's see. I'll, I don't have a lot of other announcements. Just check your bulletins for things coming up. It's a little quieter. Been a hectic schedule in uh, December, and uh, some said today it's kind of nice to get back to routine. Except for the I didn't hear that coming from our young people at school starts tomorrow, but they weren't looking forward to the routine. But uh, hey, Brian, did Brianna said something to me about a, Is there a meeting on Wednesday night? For yes. The yeah, there is a meeting on Wednesday night. If you're interested in the Cooks and Hills trip, that's in your bulletins. But we'll meet here at seven o'clock. I know there's several that are interested and. In, and that'll be an informational meeting as we plan to go to Cooks and Hills in March. And so if you're interested at all, um, sounds like we'll be doing some deck work on some new homes. They're building new homes. And I don't know how many years this church has supported Cooks and Hills. Long, long time. Anybody know? 40 years? 30 years? More? A long time. Cooks and Hills has been a blessing to who knows how many hundreds of, of young people that uh, had a rough upbringing and, and were put in a Christian home environment. They're building new homes. I mean, it's a, it's a multi-million dollar project that they're doing. And I think just a testimony to the Christian churches that uh, support this ministry. And I was able to go there once. Uh, we had a basketball tournament there and we stayed in the homes of, of these families and uh, it was just a real blessing. So I'm looking forward to our return trip. So if you're interested, seven o'clock Wednesday night on that trip. Um, I think that's all the announcements we have for now. Just check your bulletins. Um, as we enter our prayer time, um, some of you were asking about Laura. Laura Hall was in the hospital this week. She was supposed to go home yesterday. I saw her Friday and uh, kind of the same issue she had a few weeks ago with her heart beginning to race and uh, they changed her medication. She was just a, a pleasure to talk with. We had a fun conversation and uh, appreciate her faith and uh, she, she hates it that it's really hard for her to come to church. And um, so if you run into her, if you feel led, write her a note. She loves her church people very much, but it's just really difficult at this point in her life to get out. And it always is a blessing when we see her and Helga and some others that are older, but, uh, but it's tough. But she's doing very well and uh, um, was back to her normal self, I think. So she was going home yesterday. Also, you might pray uh, the Kriegel family was just here, Carla and Ted and the kids. Uh, but they just got a phone call from Megan, who was in a car accident, and so you could, they were pretty shook up. I think Megan was fine. She made the call and said, I'm fine. Um, don't know the details. If she was probably on her way here, I'm guessing, but I don't know. But um, it tends to shake up a family when there's a, a car accident, so we'll lift up the Kriegels, and we know that God will provide what they need. Um, also, just want to mention, many of you are familiar with the, the George Cadden and the family, lived a couple miles north. I didn't know George, but I know that his passing would affect us, and uh, we want to remember their family. Um, Edie's friend, John Breeden, um, having some difficulties, but I think on the upward, uh, doing better that way. That's been on the prayer chain recently. Um, so some of the others you're familiar with, we've been praying for them. Um, just continue to lift those up. But uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer now, and uh, let's just bow to him. I'm going to lead us through something. Our Sunday school class we're doing on prayer right now, and, and uh, a technique. We today we talked about patterns for prayer, and sometimes it's helpful to have a pattern for your prayer. They suggested the Acts method, where your adoration, you begin your prayer adoring God. You go to confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, just a fancy word for asking. I like to use the word pray for a pattern. We start with praise, 
And that's a great way to start your prayers is just to say, God, you are good. And so we're going to, I'm just going to spell through that. R stands for repentance. Perhaps there's a sin that uh, you've been dealing with or that entered this week and we felt the temptation. And this is a great time just to repent and just to go before God and said, sorry for those thoughts. I'm sorry for my actions or whatever that might be. And then uh, PR, the A stands for ask. That's the time for you to ask. Ask for some of the things that we've mentioned here today. Some of uh, we'll pray for Laura, I'll pray for the Kriegels and others on our prayer list. Pray for your own self as well. And that's, the, that's what the Y stands for is yourself. Pray for yourself, your church family, leadership, all those things that your life is involved with. So, so I'm just going to give us some quietness, and I'm just going to say P for praise. And then I'm just going to give you a few seconds, and you just praise God as best you can uh, for his goodness and, and just uh, recognize him for who he is. And the R will be for repentance, and we'll just have some quietness. Then we'll just ask... The A stands for ask, and finally for yourself. So we'll do that. It's a little different than we normally do it, but we're going to grow in prayer a little bit today. So let's bow before him. We begin with praise. Lift him up. Repentance. The A stands for ask. Just feel free to ask our loving Father for what's on your heart. Share your heart with him in these next few seconds. The Y stands for yourself. Just bring your personal requests. Ask God to to help your life be a beacon of light for those around. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the quietness that we can slow ourselves a little bit and, and uh, be still. And we know that you are God. We, we praise you uh, for many things, uh, for your faithfulness, um, for your strong love for us. We praise you for forgiveness. We praise you for your salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. Father, we do ask that you be specifically with the Kriegels even now. Um, watch over the situation, be with Megan, thankful that uh, from what we know she appears to be okay, but uh, just um, give them the encouragement that they might need. Thank you for being with those we've mentioned that have done, had health issues and sickness and, and hospital stays, and we know that uh, you are strength during those times as well, so continue to watch over those. Father, bless us as we begin a new series today, as we strive to be Christ-like. Um, uh, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
many of you have a New Year's resolution? Oh, let's see some participation. There you go, a lot of you. I can remember that I always had a new resolution every quarter at Iowa State that that quarter would come around, I'd study more and pick up my grades. Never happened. It seems like uh, TV now, everybody talks about a New Year's resolution and and uh, there has been a change. You might not have noticed. The elders have moved ahead one month. So we're not on the same month we've been on the last decade. So that's a big change. <laughs> but I think we can handle it. Uh, this morning when I came in uh, on TV, I wanted to see the weather. But uh, they were talking about uh, the owner of Facebook, uh, Mike, uh, Mark uh, Zuckerberg. I think that's it. Thanks, because I had Shatterbug and everything else before it came up, so I appreciate that you've uh, corrected me. But he's going to read a book a month, and you can follow that on Facebook if you want to. Now, that's if you want to. So I, I looked around a little bit to find New Year's resolution, and of all places I went to was the Huntington Post. Now, if you're familiar with that, that's a real liberal site. And most generally, they don't have a whole lot that interests me. But this time they had New Year's resolutions, 10 tips, a mannerly 2015, and they were actually pretty good. So I'm going to take more than the three minutes that I've been given and talk a little bit about that. First was set short-term goals. Second was in order to have an orderly or mannerly uh, 2015. The second was quit making excuses for frenemies. Now that's a new word for those people that you think are friends, but they're really your enemies. Get some sleep. I could say amen to that. Create a vision board. Now, that's a good idea. So sometimes we want to set a goal, and so you can put it up on a board and, and watch and, and see how close that's happening and renew that daily. Uh, buy a new wallet, and I'd say that goes for purses as well. Get rid of all those things that are in there that you don't have a need for. Uh, I see Jamie's checking his out. Let go of old wounds once and for all. Pay it forward. Pay it forward was a good idea because if you have, what they said was if, if you had a, a lady behind you at the checkout counter and obviously they were short of money, just pay for it for them and you'll feel good. Be patient and present. And, and that's, that's something that I would really like to do, meaning if you have a conversation with someone, don't interrupt. Be patient and listen and be present. And I think that's really important. This is a good one, show grace. Ten uh, was redefine success. So if you will, I'd like you to turn to Romans 12. I'm going to read the first and second verse. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, to view, um, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not, confer, do not conform any longer to the pattern of the world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind. Now, the Greek word for transform, I believe, is metamorph metamorpho, which means metamorphosis, uh, like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, good, pleasing, and perfect will. Your assignment this week would be to read the rest of Romans 12. Because I believe that you will be able to transform to the goals that you've set for yourself. And those, trans those goals are not by yourself. Not like this list from Huffington Post, but you will have the help of the Holy Spirit as, along the way, being transformed. Now, why does this fit with communion? Because at communion time, this is the perfect time for us to renew ourselves, to be transformed to what God expects of each one of us. During communion time, not only do we think about Christ's death and his resurrection and the potential for our salvation, but each week we have the perfect time to think about transforming ourselves in which God intended us to do.
Let's pray. My dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you give us the opportunity to transform ourselves, to be a sacrifice, our body like Christ was, to encourage others to know Christ as we do. I thank you for the love and the grace that you give each one of us. These things we thank you for and ask in Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings this morning that you've given to us. We ask that as we take this offering that it blesses many others. In this name we pray. Amen.
I don't know what that word means exactly, and I'm not even sure if it's one word or two words. Christ-like. If you know the answer to that grammatically or however that's supposed to be, get back to me. I sometimes spell it with two words. Sometimes I hyphenate it. Sometimes it's like it is on our picture back there, Christ-like. But I'm not so concerned about how grammatically correct that is, I guess, other than what a great word. And I mentioned last week, what kind of got me going down this path was a conversation I had with Dan DeVilder at Dave's surgery a number of weeks ago. He was talking about a man he'd been spending some time with, and again, this man was of different faith, sort of, of from where we are, but he said this about him. He said, what I like about him, he's very Christ-like. I'm not sure anybody's ever said that about me. Maybe nobody's ever said that about you. But what a great compliment to have someone say, I want to spend time with somebody because they're Christ-like. Now, we mentioned New Year's resolutions, New Year's goals. I'm not saying that has to be a resolution, but I'm saying that should be the desire of every one of us as a follower of Jesus, is to be Christ-like. And we probably all have different pictures in our mind of what that would look like. Uh, the, the list could be rather long. Some people have said you're, no more, or you're, you're like Christ most when you love or when you forgive. That's pretty good. When you love and when you forgive, you're the most like Christ. And we're not going to look at those subjects per se, but we're going to look at some different characteristics or traits. And again, this isn't meant to heap guilt on us and a New Year's resolution and, and add more stuff to your list. This is just an invitation to explore what's it mean to be Christ-like how can my life be Christ-like? And another thing, it's not necessarily about you. Sometimes we, we, we can take this, I want to be Christ-like so I can be seen. Um, we might as well be like the Pharisees, if that's the case. We want to be Christ-like so that Christ can be seen. And the way we get to be Christ-like, that's kind of what we're talking about today, uh, is to get to know Jesus better. So I appreciate that conversation we had with Dan, and um, it, was, it wasn't lengthy, but it left an impact on me, and I thought, how did this Catholic priest get to the point where someone said, he's Christ-like? Was he born that way? Did it just happen? He just kind of went to church all his life and went to Sunday school, or probably not that. How did he get to the point where a mature man says he's Christ-like? Was it by accident? We live in a world that seems to do everything it can to draw us away from being Christ-like. I mean, think of how many things take us the opposite direction of being Christ-like. Over and over again, we don't have very many places in society that push us towards being Christ-like. So how, how do we get there? I think that man got there because he trained to be Christ-like. It was a priority. It wasn't an accident. It didn't happen automatically. There were some steps that he took that led him to this place where he was described as Christ-like. And I think the difference sometimes between that and this is sometimes we try to be Christ-like or we try to do something. It'd be like me trying to pick up this guitar and I'm going to try to play a song for you. I have no clue how to play a guitar. My bar plays it, my boys play it. I have no idea how to play a guitar. I could try for the next half hour to play a song, and I could try really hard, and I could do it all my effort into trying, and it might get a little bit better by the end of the half hour, but probably not a lot. But I'm self-confident, though, if I trained this coming year to play a guitar, if I took the time and trained rather than tried, you would recognize a, a tune by the end of that time. And I think that's the difference sometimes is we try really hard to live this Christian walk and we try hard not to lie and we try hard to uh, do the whole list of things. 
I mean, it's a whole list of things for all of us. We try really hard, but I want to encourage you, maybe train and, and distinguish between those two things. A long time ago, uh, there was a preacher named Timothy, and he preached in a city named Ephesus. Ephesians is written about that. If Ephesus was a, a big city. It was a sin city. It would have been the Las Vegas probably of that time. Timothy was mentored and cared for by a, a great preacher that loved him. And Paul writes, and Paul was a great encourager of Timothy, and we all need those encouragers in our life. And he says, I want you to lead well, and I want you to further the teaching of Jesus in this church. And so, if you would, quickly turn to 1 Timothy 4, 7. 1 Timothy 4, 7. And this is what he writes, this young preacher. And we're going to look at some other passages as well, so you can leave it open to that, or we will go back to that passage. But 1 Timothy 4, 7, again. Paul writes, mentoring this young preacher, have nothing to do with irrelevant silly myths, and I love this, and maybe you want to circle it or highlight it or underline it or star it or whatever you want to do, train yourself for godliness. While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Train yourself for godliness. Physical training is of some value, I love physical training. I've spent my life doing physical training. Maybe not the last few years, but I spent a lot of, no comments needed there, okay? Godliness is of value in every way, holding promise for both this life and the life which is to come. It says, train yourself to be godly. Timothy, that's important that you do that. Madison, it's important that we train ourselves to be godly. And so if, if you're thinking through now one. What have I done that's training for godliness? What am I doing that's training myself to be Christ-like, godliness? Paul knew the Christian life was not automatic. He knew it didn't come easy. He knew it took time. Serving in this Las Vegas-type city would be a challenge for a young preacher, and Timothy would need the discipline, this discipline to train himself in order to lead effectively. Discipline. We love that word. We hate that word. And we use it a lot at the start of every new year. Great. Now the preacher's dumping a New Year's resolution on us. That's not what I'm here today to do. The goal of Christ's likeness is not to heap another characteristic that you need to do and make sure you do it. I just want you to explore in 2015 this person of Jesus and spend some time with him. And by spending time with him, you become more Christ like. I'm probably more like Barb than I was 27 years ago, which is a good thing. But I didn't get that without spending time with her. I've learned things from her, and she's learned things from me, and, and we're probably more like each other than we want to admit at times. Not completely all the same. Not alike. But we get to be like somebody by spending time with them, and that's what I want this encouragement to you through this Christ Lake series is to spend some time. It, it won't be easy to be godly. It won't be easy to be Christ-like. There will be some discipline, some things you might have to rearrange to do that. But I want you to think, what am I training myself for? Am I training myself? Do I have any spiritual disciplines in my life that are taking me to be Christ-like? So we'll, we'll look at some of that. Paul gives us this picture, and he talks about a gymnasium where athletes train and condition Athletes, as we know, go through strict training and, and, and really incredible athletes out there today. Their body's in incredible shape. But Timothy knows you do, a coach can't do that for you. I can't do that for you. I, I coach 7th and 8th grade boys basketball. I can't make them get in better shape all the time. Some of that comes from their own. I can encourage, but when they go home, they can eat all the junk they want, and they can lay on the couch all they want. And so it's sort of a personal thing. And Paul writes those things, train yourself for godliness. Godliness is taking our eyes off ourselves in the simple terms and focusing on what God wants. That's how I say is, is godliness, Christ-likeness, taking our eyes off ourselves and trying to figure out what God wants. Jesus was our example. I love the verses on there. 
Think through the things that you're probably somewhat skilled at. Marjorie makes these beautiful memory verse cards for us, not because she was probably born with that ability. She probably trained it's to some degree and practiced and, and spent some time. I've done woodworking, and I've gotten better at it. Why? Because I've trained, and I've put time in. Some of you like to sew, and, you, and you're a good seamstress, and you're good at making those things, not because you were born with that ability, you train yourself. Some are musically, some are artistic. Sherry has trained herself in, in the world of art, and she's become good at it. And so there's this big difference between trying to paint a picture and training to paint a picture. I think the same applies in the spiritual realm. We can try to be like Christ, and we've all tried. But when we train, we become more like Christ. And so think through, how am I training to be like Christ? How are my eyes on God? This should be our attitude to have the mind of Jesus Christ. Philippians talks about that. It's not about being perfect. That's not what this is about, that we reach some level of perfection. We know that's not even attainable. We've tried that. The purpose of putting disciplines in our life isn't to check it off our checklist. The purpose of putting disciplines in our life is so that we can know Christ better. That's why prayer is important. That's why serving others is important. That's why spending quiet time and, and Bible study is important. We don't do those things so we can be shiny Christians. We do those things so we can understand Jesus better and so that our lives might, in return, reflect Him better. And so this isn't a list. If you do this, this, and this, I mean, just look at the Bible, the Pharisees. They were good at discipline. They were good at those things, but they did it for themselves, not for the glory of God. And so make sure we distinguish this isn't about being perfect, but by imitating Christ, we get to know him better, and I believe others get to see him in us. Paul says in Philippians 3, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. He says, I have counted all things that the world offers as rubbish. And he had a, a pretty good pedigree. I count those as rubbish compared to knowing Jesus Christ. It says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. I train because Christ Jesus has made me his own. I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize, the upward call in Christ Jesus. I think he's saying... You don't become Christ-like by going to church only. I want to challenge you. What is your plan to be more Christ-like? What disciplines, what are you doing in your life that's some sort of training? It doesn't have to be complicated. But what's, what's the difference between trying and training in your life right now? Am I, am I training to be Christ-like? But it doesn't happen by walking through these doors. This is... I hope helpful to you as you hear someone speak about God's Word, but I don't want you to confuse that with training only. There's more training that needs to be done. A few years back, my dad had open heart surgery. Happened suddenly. I believe, I, I can't remember the details, but I think he went on on Friday and Monday he had surgery, so it was something that needed attention. And... Um, kind of caught us off guard we'd been pretty healthy and hadn't had any issues and so dad had never had any issues before so it kind of scared us all a little bit um but through that process i remember going there and we were there for a surgery and everything went fine and and he had this double bypass surgery and and it's a big deal when it's your own family but it's not, it's not uncommon anymore. So he made it through surgery and, and all that, but I remember being home, and I thought, what can I do? They owned a house in Lincoln, Nebraska, and they had kind of remodeled a house in Brown, Nova, 
And it had been years since I'd been to Lincoln, Nebraska, where I grew up in the home. I grew up a simple ranch home on Riviera Drive. Well, while I was there, I thought, I'm going to mow the yard, I'm going to clean up things and do the best I can do. And it was kind of an eye-opening time, and I suppose my emotions were high anyway because of dad's surgery, and you just never know what's going to happen. But I remember mowing the yard, and I go, wow, this yard's a lot smaller than it used to be. It took me about 15 minutes to mow the front yard and the backyard. I go, that didn't seem that way years ago. This seemed like a great big backyard years ago. And I remember driving around and went to Holmes Lake where I used to ride my bike and it seemed like such a long ride to Holmes Lake and, and I would sneak down there and go fishing and, and it seemed like such a, a long ride down there. And, and I jumped in the car and I rode to Holmes Lake and reminisced on all the fun there, but it didn't seem like a very long ride to Holmes Lake anymore. And I drove by Hanlon's Hideaway, which wasn't even Hanlon's Hideaway anymore. That was the place where we gathered and we had baseball games in this empty lot two or three blocks from home, and it seemed like such a big area, but now it was townhomes, and there were families enjoying these beautiful homes. And I drove to May Morley Elementary School, and again, it wasn't a very big elementary school, but it sure seemed big at the time, and the playground where we used to play, have recess, and where we used to play dodgeball wasn't very big, and it seemed so big at the time. And it was strange as I reflected on those. I remember walking, driving down to the end of the block where sometimes I would put three dimes in the bus and go to downtown Lincoln. But right by their houses where Cindy Deal, at 14 years old, took a gun and shot herself. She was my age. She was one year older, but in my grade. And so I was flooded with all these memories. But they were different than I kind of remembered them. And I concluded that Change happens in life. Change is a necessary part of life. Things weren't the same as they used to be. And part of it was perspective. And as we grow, our perspective changes. But also we understand change is a necessary part of life. And as much as we'd like to hold on to some of those old memories and things, we're different now than when we used to be. And change is a necessary part of life. I bet you, you've been down those memory roads before too. I saw some head nods. It seemed so big back then and it seemed so different back then, but I was different back then. Change is a necessary part and change is a part of anything that grows. Growth oftentimes brings change. You get where I'm going? We can change to be more Christ-like. Growth brings change. Perspective is important too. I viewed that same house that I grew up in. It seemed so big. It's a tiny house. The yard seemed big. It's a tiny yard. Perspective plays a role in our change too. Growth means change. When the boys were back, having a make a move. They found their Legos. 24-year-olds playing with Legos. <laughs> Growth brings change. They don't play with Legos regularly anymore because they've grown. I wouldn't want my 24-year-old playing with Legos all his life. Growth brings change. And it's fun to go back how different are you? How more like Christ are you than when you first came to him, spiritually speaking? Paul described a couple churches that way. He says, in Revelation, he says, this is a church that's lost its first love. You're doing all the things right. You're teaching the correct doctrine. You're, you're, you're doing all those things right. You're, you're toiling hard. You're working hard. And you're teaching the correct things. But he says to the Ephesian church, you've lost your first love. Hmm. To the church at Sardis, he says the opposite. He says, your love is strong, but you're letting some incorrect teachings come in. And he kind of scolds them for that. Kind of reminds me of Paul talking about truth and grace, the importance of having both those things in our lives. And a lot of change since Paul wrote that Ephesian letter. If you were to read the last part of the Ephesian letter, he commends them for their undying love. So somewhere, 
from that letter, undying love, to this letter in Revelation, they had lost that love. They're commended for an undying love, and later on they're scolded because they're doing all the right things. They're working hard. They're toiling hard. They're teaching correct doctrine, but love is absent. All change isn't always good either. The growth brings change. Might be good for us to journey back to when we first became followers of Jesus Christ. There was excitement. There was a love that was real and love that was strong and bold. And, and reading His Word seemed normal, seemed important, and you needed that strength. And we met those times where we met the Lord in, in our quiet times or in our reading with anticipation and expectation and, and everything was new and, and, and that was good. Maybe we've experienced times when we've fell from that first love. I have. I think we all have. But it's important that we capture that love. It's not always going to be that way. My love for Barb and Barb's love for me is a lot different than it was 27 years ago. The passion is still there, but it's different than it used to be. Some of you know what I'm talking about, but there's still love. And I really wouldn't want to go back probably to what I would call an immature love. It was great and the feelings were wonderful, but I'd like to think we've grown in our love through those years. And our love makes us more comfortable around each other now. And there's not a pressure and there's, there's not a show and, and we can be ourselves and there's, a, there's just an ease about our love relationship now than what it was. And it was great back then, you know, you know what I'm saying. But we've matured and, and we've changed and, and I think those are growth changes that happen because you learn to love. You train yourself in those ways. And don't ask Barb, I still have a long ways to go. The passion is different, but it's not absent, just different. And so it might be good for us to go back and revisit that first love when we first became followers and everything seemed normal to be in the Word and everything seemed to be good and, and prayer seemed to be honest and real. Hopefully as we begin this next few weeks called Christ-like, it will take us, back, take us back to our first love. We won't be like that Ephesian church where it says, you're doing great, you're working hard, but you've lost that first love. How do we go back? We're busy people. We're, the speed we live life is pretty crazy. How do we still journey with God? Let me ask you this. Is godliness natural or unnatural activity? An adventure. Is, that an, is, is godliness an, a natural or unnatural adventure? Does it come automatically because we've been grown up in the church or we've been raised the right way? Or because we have personalities that tend itself that way or we have abilities that, that sort of lead us in that direction? Again, we have a world that, that pulls us away from godliness, pulls us away from Christ-likeness. So how do we rekindle that? How do we, how do we get there? I think it takes training versus trying. It takes being on purpose. It takes being intentional that I want to be Christ-like, not for my own glory, but for God's glory. If you still have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy 4, we'll start in verse 6. It says, if you put these things, and the word here it means not to issue orders. He says, don't issue orders to your congregation. Don't issue, don't issue orders to your church family. He says, just suggest these things. If you put these things out there, and the one writer says, guidance that is given humbly and gently seems to be more effective than orders given people, uh, than orders given people are more easily led than driven. I, I find that true in coaching. I sometimes can yell, and I used to do a lot more yelling in my coaching but I found that most of us know when we screw up and we need encouragement and we need suggestions. Say, try it this way. Dads, I didn't always do that with my kids outside of athletics either. Suggest, put these things before them, he says. He says, uh, put these things before the brothers. Um, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have 
followed. Have nothing to do with irrelevant silliness. Rather, underline this, highlight it. Train yourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we hope our hope set on a living God who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe, command and teach these things. Paul writes this young preacher, take these things seriously, train yourself. If you want to be the pastor, if you want to be the person you need to be, then you'll need to train for this task of being Christ-like. Physical training has some merit, it's got some good stuff, but God in it has value for this life and the life which is to come. Paul says it to me, this doesn't happen by hoping to be Christ-like. This doesn't happen by walking through the doors of your church. He says godliness happens with some discipline, with a plan. The problem is most of us can look pretty godly to our community. But most of us know sometimes we've been stuck in a rut, sometimes spiritually. So maybe it's time to go back to that and discover that first love. As we close, I just want to ask you some questions. Are you feeling far from God today? Has genuine worship sort of been missing? If that's the case, I invite you to our series, some disciplines that might help you. Again, I'm not forcing these on you. These are just some suggestions, some things that I need to grow in, some things that have helped me grow in my spiritual journey. This isn't a, if you do this, 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 and this, you will be Christ-like. That's not what this series is, is. The Pharisees tried that over and over again, and they were the people that Jesus <coughs> reprimanded the most. Christ-like, it's an invitation to grow closer to God. What disciplines are currently in place in your life that are helping you become Christ-like? Some things we might look at is just slowing our pace a little bit, slowing down in life. That's pretty difficult. That's pretty difficult. And some of you do a great job of that. I know one of our farmers just loves to be outside in the mornings, even on cold mornings, because it's him and God sometimes. That's slowing. That's giving God time. Being Christ-like might mean that we learn a little more about prayer, humility, self-control. There are so many things that we could talk about. Join us for the Christ-like series. Let's stand as we sing.